And thank you, Anna. And I hate reductionism, but, um, but I'm very, very appreciative and grateful for the time that you're going to give to this topic. What I want to talk about is democracy and evidence at the edges. And um, as Anna said, I'm the director of the Inclusive Design Research Center, and I have the honor of being um, the director of this growing global community that's concerned about what's happening to people at the edges as our society is digitally transformed and globally connected. Um, I'm going to start with a very obvious statement, which of course we've heard a lot about, democracy and truth are under attack, but I want to talk about, ah, okay, you're not seeing the slides I'm seeing. It's, it's interesting that the technology talk is the one where the technology <laughs> doesn't work. Is it working now? Okay, good. And do I hit this, yeah, just use this, okay, good, great. <laughs> Okay, so, duh, a very obvious statement. Um, but the, the piece I want to talk about is a different threat, not the cybersecurity threat, but one of the casualties, I think, of polarization is that we fail to self-criticize and we fail to grow. Um, what happens when both truth and democracy is under threat is we defend democracy and, and truth, and in the process, we tend to reduce them. Democracy is reduced to majority rules, and truth is reduced to quantified evidence. And I know this is a cheap shot, but um, what is democracy when it supports a cheap beer over critical health services for someone's child? It is a cheap threat, um, cheap sort of joke or point to make, but it doesn't express the fury, and I don't know how to express the fury I felt when I was encouraged to celebrate beer while looking at the face of someone whose essential services have been cancelled. And I, I wonder, where is, I mean, we saw the survey of what we think the state of democracy is in Canada, but this, I'm very shamed, ashamed by this when I talk to my friends around the world. And what is the effect of majority rules on people struggling to survive when the majority takes survival for granted? Um, what is truth when it only attends to the large homogenous numbers? What happens to the truth of those heterogeneous minorities? How can they count? If you take any population and you plot their needs and characteristics on a multivariate scatter plot, because we're all complex, what you see is a starburst. And what you'll see is that there is a critical mass in the middle, and as you spread out, um, the, the dots get further and further apart. That critical mass in the middle is what, what everything is designed for, the people we pay attention to. That is where the scope is. Everything outside of those circle is, is where there is no scope, there is no influence, there is no power. And where if our democracy is a popularity contest, that's where the unpopular are. We. The, the, the other thing I want to self-critique as a progressive, as a fellow progressive, as was stated earlier, is that we defend diversity and inclusion by pulling up the bulwarks around protected identity groups. And what I want to ask is what happens to people who fall through the cracks or get stranded at the edges? It makes it even more difficult for anyone that doesn't have those identities, that doesn't meet the criteria of those identity groups to get the type of social justice that we think our democracy affords. And of course, this is a tech session. I, um, I do speak code, um, but I'm not a techno solutionist. So I wanna talk about what is happening with technology and data-driven decision-making that amplifies and automates these patterns. I'm gonna tell you a story. I worked uh, with the Ministry of Transport, which turned 100 years, and they wanted advice on how to deal with automated and connected vehicles. I was able to play with a number of learning models. These are the intelligent systems that are supposed to tell cars what to do in intersections. Do I go forward? Does it uh, change direction or does it stop? 
And what I was able to do was to bring a number of anomalous, um, one of the, some of those edge individuals to these models. These were individuals that were pushing their wheelchairs backwards through an intersection. An unexpected way to move through an intersection. In fact, when most people encounter them at an intersection, they, ha they often will grab the chair and push it back onto the, the side of the intersection where they came from. What I discovered in testing all of these um, machine learning models was that they all ran them over. They all decided that um, this was not a, a scenario where they needed to stop. Um, they all said, well, wait a sec, these models are immature, we don't have enough data, they're not yet smart enough, come back. When we've given them more data, we've made them smarter. Um, what happened when I came back, and they had fed the, the systems learning material that about what happens with individuals um, going through intersections in wheelchairs is they ran them over with greater confidence. And that led me to think about it. Well, wait a sec, that's obvious. That is what's going to happen, given the way that we think about truth, the way we think about evidence, the way we develop knowledge. Because what's happening here is the majority is overpowering the minority. They are outliers, and so if it's majority rules, if it's statistical significance, then that's what happens at the edge. So progress is not always, uh, of course, a good thing for us progressives. Um, I went back to look at early speech recognition. I had been working in the 80s on um, dysarthric speech, and this is, these are individuals that have repeatable speech but only their family and friends who are very familiar with them can understand them. And we were able to reach uh, 200 words recognition with voice recognition systems. And how many of you today have used voice recognition systems to get essential services or to talk to your government or to, I mean, I'm sure many of you are at least this last week have done that. But what I discovered was that um, those same speech models were not recognized by any of the smarter, much more uh, technically advanced systems that are there. The other issue, and the reason why I, I actually hate giving lightning talks, is that brevity means we can't take many notional steps from our current stance. Where does that leave people that are very different from us? Where does this leave people that are very different from the majority? And it is a vicious cycle, and you can't read everything I've got up here. I can't even read it, but um, it, it perpetuates through all of our systems, um, whether it is how we design things, what we put on the market, whether it's our education, the products, the services, the environments that we have to deal with, our democracy, our education, our knowledge, our, our idea of truth. If you are not in that middle, if you're out in those edges of that scatter plot of humanity, that starburst of humanity, then you are caught in a vicious cycle. So some of, um, because I need to be brief, I'll tell you a few things that I've been doing to try to address this as a, as a techie. One of them is, and I can't describe it fully, but I've been playing with something called the lawnmower of justice. Um, what I've done is I've taken that Gaussian curve for any of you that are academics or researchers. It's basically the distribution of all of our needs and characteristics on a multivariate scatter plot. And I have said, okay, we're going to take away the privilege of being the same as many other people. I'm going to say that I will not allow the model to view more than four or five or six repeats of a single element or a single need or a single characteristic. And that what that does is it allows the system to attend to the, to the edges, to the tails, to those um, extremes. I'm, I've also been looking at the issue of privacy. And one of the things is that we've talked a lot about privacy. We don't seem to fully understand what privacy means. And we ha we're under this illusion that if we have uh, privacy by design, if we anonymize or de-identify the data at source, then um, nothing terrible can be done with it. But um, the one thing that 
I want you to note about those edges is if you are the most vulnerable to abuse and misuse which is the, of, of your data, which is those individuals at the edge, then you're also going to, the most likely to be re-identified. If you're the only black person in a white neighborhood, if you're the only one putting in an order for a colostomy, colostomy bag in your neighborhood or at your place of employment, it's really easy to figure out what data belongs to you. And so we've been looking at data platform co-ops, ways to govern and own and control your own data. The message that I want to give about attending to the edge, and this is a study we did for UNESCO, was that if you include the edge right from the beginning, then and plan not just for the center, plan not just for the majority, then you are going to save money and you are going to have greater longevity with the services, the products, the environments that you create. Because what will happen is it might take a little bit longer, it might cost a little bit more at the beginning, but you'll have something that's adaptable and something that doesn't continuously need to be hacked or need to be remodeled, um, et cetera. And so you will create an, a much more flexible and adaptable system. And um, much of this, uh, we promote this notion of the three dimensions of inclusive design. Recognize everybody is unique. We're all different. Um, and what we need to do is to understand our own difference. Uh, provide self-knowledge. So not just make machines smarter, but make ourselves smarter about what it is that we need so we can self-advocate. We need to ensure that these tables, all the processes of design, of governance, et cetera, are designed inclusively. We heard about people who are the first joining government, but joining a government that was never designed for them. And the struggles and the frictions that you feel when you are asked to, you're invited to the table, but the table really doesn't work for you. And we need to think in systems. We need to think beyond that tweet. We need to think beyond, because we're living in a complex adaptive system, and we can't be brief about the really, really complex, important, critical issues that people are feeling. It's easy to say buck a beer, but it isn't easy to talk about all of the very, very important things and critical life-threatening things that people are facing in this society. So the, my last message, intelligence and design that understands, recognizes, and serves diversity is better able to respond to the unexpected, detect risk, adapt to change, transfer to new contexts. It has greater longevity. It may reduce disparity. And it may lift us out of some of the ruts that we're experiencing. Thank you. I love Vida. <laughs> um, so what an incredible first lightning talk for this particular um, conversation, the political realities of the tech stack. Um, I love the fact that you wove together the, what you heard from the panel before um, with the uh, women in power um, and how we actually start to have to um, understand how to plan for that edge. So coming up next, we have Vas Vednar, who's head of public policy at a new AI startup, Delphia. Um, so this is going to be a question straight at you. How are you planning for that edge? And um, let's hear you come up and, and say your piece. So much. Thank you so much. I'm actually not going to be diving into Delphia. I hope that's not too disappointing. Um, my understanding is that I've been cast a little bit as the villain of this panel. You know, I'm You can coming, take it. You can take it. I can take it, and I, I will take it. So I'm coming from the private sector. And the private sector, we ha seem to have this rudimentary, rudimentary understanding or that we perpetuate. You know, it's inherently bad. So some of you, maybe your ears are turned off. You understand my perspective, what I'm going to say about public policy and politics. Uh, or you're not even here in the room, which could be you know, some of your cohorts, given the way we've organized the conference. 
I'm going to offer you a bunch of different thoughts that I hope seed great conversation in our panel. The first, from a public policy perspective, is just the reality that much of what we call public policy has actually been privatized. And this has nothing to do with tech, it has to do with how public policy is evolving. We increasingly outsource and pay for expertise that may come from a think tank, a consulting firm, or a panel. Uh, I chaired the expert panel on youth employment. Uh, prior to this being at Delphia, I worked on the public policy team at Airbnb. Prior to that, I was at a think tank that looked at the economic you know, factors for shared democratic capitalism and prosperity. So that's a little bit of my perspective. I'm pro-technology, but I'm also pro-public policy. I also emailed my fellow panelists what does the tech stack mean? And no one replied, so if anyone knows, um, I do think it's like a little bit challenging to, to lump kind of all technology pieces together, but let's do it and see where we get. Also, I'm obviously not a designer because my slides are extremely rudimentary. So, what are the political realities of the tech stack? Where to start? Um, Ryerson has helped me frame this as how, how we can move forward with an eye out for tech's unintended consequences. When it comes to thinking about the political realities of starting to govern technology or having government interact more with technology, I think we need to think of three things as foundational. The first is that our outcomes are only going to be as good and as strong as our democratic institutions, right, as our regulators. Secondly, if government doesn't continue to seek to you know, be a little bit more creative about how they find that balance with technology, I think we could see more threats to our economic prosperity. We often kind of speak out of both sides of our mouth. Um, we invest broadly in something we call innovation. We talk about Canada's doesn't have a startup problem, it's got a scale-up problem. I'm not, that's true. Um, and then we're also kind of speaking more and more about how we can curb these unintended consequences, anticipate them, and kind of govern um, global platforms that are not necessarily within the jurisdiction of a municipality, a province, or you know, even fitting well with our federal government. Why do I care? Why should you care? Why does this matter to democracy? I wonder and I worry that as we see that pace of technology and that usership, that participation, uh, accelerate. What could this generation, our generation, see as an evolving role for the state? So an example of this is um, dot health. I don't know if any of you are participating in that. Yes, aggregating your, your digital records, your health records, so that they can move with you. Thank you so much for putting up your hand. I love audience participation like that. Now, maybe that should have never been, like that is a reaction, that is a private sector tech, homegrown hero reaction to a failed government mandate around e-health. Now, maybe that should have never been the purview. Maybe government should have never primarily owned that. But if you're able to do that individually for a modest fee from your phone, how does that or how could it change what you see as being the role of the state? What are some of the, you know, at least what I think are the political realities of seeking to regulate this tech stack? One is that there's a bit of an invisibility politically, right? Governments are, tend to be a little slow, they probably should be, um, but we can also be quite territorial. And a lot of these broader, more interdisciplinary problems um, that we've seen that, that tailor studies <laughs> with platforms don't lend themselves well to you know, any one particular ministry. Um, it's also difficult to pinpoint them as a political priority. Government is increasingly seen as a vector for scaling. Uh, when I worked at the Ministry of Education, apparently, you know, I've had like 18 jobs. When I worked at the Ministry of Education, government was often viewed as a vector for scaling. So people would come to the ministry with great ideas. Um, maybe their work was hyper-localized. It was a pilot or it was at one school board or one school. And the role of the state, the role of government, was seen as something that could then infuse this throughout. And when you think about how public policymaking has been evolving, we have much more of a kind of Spice Girl model of public policy, right? Tell me what you want, what you really, really want. We don't necessarily elect thought leaders, we elect thought followers, right? Tell me what you're going to do for me and that's kind of what I'm gonna hold you to. 
I, I pointed to that tension in terms of economically betting hard on innovation. But something else I'll bring up from, it's not quite a diversity perspective, but an observation I'll share is that we're also seeing, first of all, it's very complicated to talk about you know, all technology kind of factors together in the way I'm trying to with you. But there is a little bit of anothering, of anothering in tech that I think is happening in our Canadian public policy conversations. Most of the global platforms that we've uh, villainized or vilified are not made in Canada. So I also just want to point out and put it as food for thought that there may be an inequity in terms of how we're deciding, you know, who's problematic, who needs or is having that clash with the state. Um, I'll point to Shopify. We want 10 Shopify's, right? I like Shopify. Shopify is great. Nobody is calling on Shopify to automatically charge HST on its businesses that are <laughs> earning more than $30,000. I'm not saying that they necessarily should. I am just pointing out that we don't have those conversations. Another company with a bit of a halo, it's not Canadian, is um, Etsy. Right? I guess it's just something about artisans <laughs> that they're like, they're not on our radar. But these activities are kind of the same that we're looking at in terms of platforms and actors and what businesses people may or may not be conducting on them. What is the future of technology and public policy? What are we seeing? What should we see? Fundamentally, I mean, I don't think this will change, but government should continue to own regulation and enforcement. We cannot expect private companies to reliably take that on, even though surveys are showing, like that um, El Elderman, Edelman Trust Survey, the Trust Survey, people are looking to business to lead. People are looking for businesses to lead on diversity, you know, women on boards. These are things that we're tentatively kind of trying to make public policies around, but people are looking for that kind of leadership that is political leadership from the private sector and perhaps also from technology companies and pushing them in that regard. Um, a very crude analogy I'll give you, and we can discuss it during questions or not, has to do with driving a car. So I don't know if people get driver's licenses anymore, but um, we have speed limits and they're posted, and you know what they are. And we make cars, and cars go much faster than the speed limit. And nobody's calling on Chrysler to make sure that when their car's in a school zone, it's not going more than 40. What we do is we hold the driver, the person accountable. And that's what a lot of platforms are engaged in conversation right now too, in terms of where the vector for accountability is, what's most appropriate, what's realistic. I think it would be odd if we moved forward without looking at what we've already established in terms of some of those baselines and goalposts. We have to continue to redefine what a reasonable role for business is um, in terms of setting desirable outcomes. Um, increasingly, the lever that the state seems to have uh, is taxation. And also, you know, I, I wanted to speak more about this, but maybe this is something more for lunch. That excellent article in the Globe and Mail this morning around how we're driving blind in Canada as policymakers. We have this crazy data deficit. You know, we have a patchwork of static data sets and we're, you know, trying to make informed public policy decisions because these are the data sets that we've trusted. How can we move forward partnering? How can we use more novel data sets to complement what Statistics Canada is using and talking about so that we have a more accurate picture of sentiment in Canada, priorities, um, you know, ideologies, what people want, what people need. And the regulatory era. I think this is not like a sexy sentence, it's also not like an evil sentence to say, but I think the next kind of phase of the digital era is around regulation. And I wanted to offer you kind of two follow-up readings uh, that aren't for me, but are very useful in this regard. One is called regulatory hacking, and it's sort of makes the case that now we have more entrepreneurs, social innovators that are fundamentally working to make the world a better place. They're going to come up against particular regulatory landscapes that they may have inherited or that may have never considered them. So how do we work together? How do we navigate that moving forward? The second is my favorite public policy book from 2017, and yes, I keep track of them. It's called Everybody Lies by economist Seth uh, Stevens-Davidson. 
he worked for a bit at Google. And it's, it's about the intimacy of the Google toolbar. So I'm willing to bet most of you would rather uh, I see you close up and naked, then share your Google search history for like the past year or the past month, right? Now the book was fundamentally mismarketed, not that I'm in marketing. Um, I think they were trying to have a kind of Mac Malcolm Gladwell thing going on. But if Google knows things like after the 2008 recession in the US, it was predicted in the hardest hit areas, there would be an increased rate of reported child abuse. When we looked at the caseloads in the book, as policy people, um, there was no uptick. And we thought, wow, that's great. When we looked at Google search toolbars, we saw much more of, why is mom mad all the time? Why did dad hit me? What does that mean for policymakers? What does that mean when it's technology and technologists that have that information? What does it mean if Google knows that if I search sore boob and upset stomach, in that sequence, that I have a much higher likelihood of having breast cancer. What should Google do? What are the responsibilities, if any, of these companies to the public good and to public policymaking? I don't have the answers for you, but I'm very happy that I could raise some of these questions and give you food for thought during this lightning talk. Thank you. Thanks very much, Vass. Obviously, we chose the right person to take on the challenge. Um, you did a great job, and I love the phrase vector of accountability. I think that's exactly what we should be thinking about right now. Um, and I think Taylor, who's the new chair in media ethics and communications at McGill University, might have some ideas on where that accountability lies in government. I hope that's what your talk is gonna be about. Sure. <laughs> Well, okay. I found out I was doing it about an hour ago, so I, uh, <laughs> we'll see what it's about. But no, I, my, oh, is that up? Sure. Um, I uh, was looking forward to moving from moderator and having to be moderate to being um, on a panel with Vass so we could just play our roles and fight in public, which would have been fun. Um, but I actually agreed with almost everything she said. Um, so that's a little bit disappointing. Um, uh, but I thought I could talk a little bit about the, 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 the politics of this, but coming from the governance side. So what does the character of our governance conversation around um, what we're calling this panel, the tech stack, look like right now? Um, and when Bass sat around the note saying, what's the tech stack, I think um, nobody knew the answer, um, partly because it, it's kind of meaningless to talk about the technology sector now. Um, the trope is that it's like talking about the electricity sector, right? It's, um, we have a suite of companies and governance mechanisms and civil society tools that are all powered by technology. And we need to figure out as a society and ultimately as a democracy how those tools and the uses of these tools are going to fit within our democratic norms, laws, and structures, right? And I, I want to make a few reflections on, um, on where we are in that conversation. And, and when I talk about the tech stack in my work, mostly it's on technologies that shape um, our public sphere, how we get information, how we share information, how that information is used in our economy and is used um, in, our, in our democracy, um, for, to, for us to participate actively in our democracy. Um, so let me just make a few observations, seven observations, quick observations about this and where we are right now. Um, but to preface them, I mean, this conversation has happened, has evolved remarkably quickly. Um, I would say, uh, a couple of years ago, there was not an appetite for a conversation about governing the technology sector. Um, a year ago, there was an openness to being persuaded about new regulatory mechanisms in engaging with the technology sector. And now there's an open search for how we should do it. And that is, an, in a public policy sphere, that is an incredibly rapid evolution, but it demands on us and a community that's been advocating for regulatory shift or for legal shift or for governance changes to engage with that conversation. Um, so first point I wanna make, I think there is a legitimate crisis um, of trust in our integrity in our technology sector right now. Um, this has to do with how companies are managed and operated um, on one side, um, but the flip of it is the effect that the companies are having on the integrity of information in our democracy itself. And that is also creating a crisis, not just and do we trust these companies and how they're operating and how the effect they're having on our lives, but do we trust the information in our democracy at all? 
and i would argue that's a very slippery slope once we head down that track can be highly highly damaging and i think we're if you look to the united states you can see what this looks like a few months or a few years ahead of us and so in the canadian context i think we really need to be concerned about what happens when the bottom falls out of that trust and information in our society the second point i want to make this is both a supply side and a demand side problem on the supply side it is the very design of the digital infrastructure itself that is having that has both positive and negative repercussions to our society and to our democracy we need to look at that design and the incentives that are built into the design of that infrastructure. And more often than not, because we've, we've allocated these goods to the private sector, these are privately driven incentives. So we need to examine those. On, this, on the demand side, we need to look at how these technologies are changing our consumption and our behavior and even our minds, how they're rewiring society to function in different ways. So it's both sides of that equation. Um, third point, I think we're in a moment now that is um, roughly analogous to the lead up to the 2008 financial crisis. You have a, a, sec a sector of the economy, of our society, um, that has built um, highly profitable markets, um, but whose financial incentives are against meaningful reform. This is not the fault of companies, it's the fault of the way we've structured these companies in our economy. And so to that, when you have a private sector that has led to a market failure and a series of negative externalities, um, that is the time for governance and for public policy. Um, so now is the time for that conversation. Uh, the fourth point, and this goes to what, what Vass was saying about how many of these governance decisions and governance processes are being outsourced to the companies themselves. Um, the regulation of speech is now happening by the algorithms of platforms. The regulation of our hotel industry <laughs> is happening largely via platform companies. And, and just before the panel, I was making this great point, which was that yes, we are now starting to have a regulatory conversation about Airbnb, but they've been in Canada for 10 years. Um, and they've been making decisions that have an impact, a social impact up until then, and to their credit, I think in the Airbnb case, less so in other platforms in my view, um, have, have taken that responsibility relatively seriously and have governed in a relatively responsible way. But that's, that's not because of being forced to do so or being brought into our democratic norms and institutions and mandated to do so. And, that, and that, that's a real disconnect we have to think about. Um, if that's the case, we need to figure out how to bring these technologies and the behavior that these technologies enable into our democratic institutions. Um, and I, th I think we need to do so, and it's critical that we do so, because it is governments that have democratic accountability. Um, it may be the case that a private company can much more efficiently moderate speech at scale in a society. I grant that. But they don't do so with a democratic mandate. And that is a disconnect that governments need to get their heads, need to engage with. It, it's going to be very difficult to figure out how we govern speech in Canada on platforms. Absolutely. Um, but if governments aren't doing it, interests that do not have the democratic integrity of Canadian society in their incentive structure are going to make that decision. And that's something we have to talk about. Um, that may or may not be a good thing. Final two things I'll say is if we're looking at governing this space, there are, I think, some easy things we can do quickly, and there are some really difficult challenges we're about to dive into. Um, on the easy side, and it's crazy to say that these are easy, but it's relative, um, we can reform our data privacy laws. There are models for how this is being done around the world. We can coordinate with those other models, and we can experiment. We can, do, we can add rigorous advertising transparency, so we always know why we're receiving the information we're receiving in this digital space. We can talk about identifying automated accounts. We can talk about taxing companies in different ways that bring them into our economy, rather than having money that, a lack of that tax revenue in our economy. We can modernize competition policy, right? There's, there's a number of things we can do relatively easily. But I would suggest um, 
there's, there's some really difficult challenges here too. And let me just mention a couple of them. W one is we need to figure out how we're gonna moderate speech at scale in our society. Um, right now that job's being outsourced. We do not know how to bring the moderation that is currently in evolution within the platform system into our own laws and norms. We need to figure out liability. Or how are we gonna transfer the liability we impose on actions in our society to actions in the digital space? We don't have a good answer to that yet. Um, and and fi final thing I'll mention is we, the, the entire algorithmic and automated system that drives the digital economy also needs to be brought into our norms and legal regimes, normative and legal regimes. And we haven't figured that out yet either. So just, I think we're headed into a pretty wicked set of governance challenges, um, but we're having them now. And that is a consequence of a real shift in how we view the technology space that's literally happened just over the last couple of years. So I'll leave it at that. Great. Thanks very much, Taylor. That's great. Thank you very much for just um, uh, pinch hitting there at the last moment, but you, you did a wonderful job of setting up the the issues that we're now facing. Um, we only have 10 minutes left for questions, so we're not, we're, I'm gonna actually open the floor immediately, but if you don't mind, I wouldn't mind asking the first question, um, which is, um, let's, I'd love for you guys to actually just riff on this notion of um, accountability, in, in specifically associated with the algorithmic biases that you reference in, at the end, um, and that you also spoke about, uh, Utah, and who is ultimately going to be responsible for this, and how are we going to start to um, uh, sort of find a solution around that? On on who, how are we, how are we, who's accountable for the new stuff that's being made, and then how do we uh, regulate the stuff that's already out there? Right, and, and I think the, the danger comes when the decisions are based upon particular data sets. So it's up to the decision makers to make transparent what is the basis of their decision, and we as the public need to be able to audit what is missing with the, the, the evidence that is being used. So I think um, it needs to be a more complex conversation than just privacy or um, AI or intelligence or evidence. Um, we need to think as well about data use regulations and um, the specific dangers of data abuse and how do we protect people uh, from those. So uh, anyone that is in a position of power and that is making a decision needs to not say, oh, the machine decided, or the evidence decided, or the majority voted in this way, or the numbers tell us this, or those sorts of things. That's not enough. We need to be able to see what, where are, what, who's represented in those numbers, who is missing, what are the gaps, and is everyone that ha is impacted by those decisions um, adequately represented within that evidence that we're bringing forward. Do you think the regulatory um, environments and government are actually prepared to have that quite more complex conversation, Taylor or Bass? No. Hey, I heard a no over here. I, I think they're getting ready. Look, public policy needs more technologists and technology needs more public policy. So talking about biases and algorithms is actually a lot easier for us than talking about some of our natural biases that we, no that we now often call or kind of, you know, euphemize as unconscious bias. So what's the penalty for in real time when I didn't get that promotion because I'm a lady or, you know, you didn't get hired because of your address or your ethnic sounding name? Those are other real ways that these biases, you know, are enacted. I know this is not the best analogy, but, you know, I think technology is ho going to be part of the solutions as well. So we know when we have research that shows, you know, if we, when we anonymize, when we take out names, when we take out addresses, when we do certain things, say with job screening and the future of work, that we have more equitable outcomes and we can agree that we want those equitable outcomes to happen and that they could probably happen more efficiently with a platform-based kind of space. So just one quick aside, when I chaired the expert panel on youth employment and we were talking about the future of work, a fundamental difference for this generation that we often talk about now is the digitization of the labor force, right? This has hyper inflated the need for social capital. And we'd say it to people without thinking. We say build a network, 
It matters who you know, and that's because the digitization of the labor market has increased the pressure on those entry-level jobs. You can get more labor market information than ever before. You can apply to a job Sunday night in your sweatpants with a glass of wine. That's not a bad thing, but it is a historically new thing. And we have not updated the other kind of facets of the job search to respond to that. I think we could see better use federally of you know, a platform approach to do that kind of matching in a way that we see is more just. I, I want to just um, alert one, th uh, like bring up one other thing. We talk a lot about algorithmic bias. We talk about uh, the human bias that finds its way into the machines. But even if we removed all of that, the, the way that we're quantifying the needs and the way that we're basing our decisions only on one person, one number, is, n is not going to reach the type of humanity that we talked at the beginning of this session. So we need to go beyond just uh, trying to eliminate those algorithmic biases, but look at the basis of how we judge what is true. Great. There's a federal panel operating right now on regulation of all communication, including internet, television, journalism, everything, everything. It's getting zero coverage. Do you know what they're doing? Like I know, and I, I read the coverage of them being appointed, and it's a pretty high level panel, so obviously. They went, they went to speak, yeah, they, and no, they're here now. They're in Toronto now at another conference, but I just wonder, I mean, it sounds to me like they're gonna make recommendations on just about everything you're talking about. Do, you, do any of you know anything about it? I don't know a ton about it. Um, I think they're, they're, they are gonna be making reforms and recommendations between, within the context of broadcast and communications policy. Now, whether or not that touches on data privacy and algorithmic auditing and all these other issues that are ultimately integral to this suite of challenges, I, I highly doubt. This is gonna be about um, whether, which industries we regulate within our telecommunications policy or not. And that's gonna be obviously a big fight, right? Is Netflix a broadcaster or um, a digital platform? Um, that is gonna be a big argument, but that is in some, that's only a piece, I think, of this broader um, policy puzzle. Taylor, it, Shauna Sylvester, and I wanted to ask you a question around the cultural context for regulation. And I'll just use the context of me and my daughter. I, my daughter gives away a lot of information, and that's been a conversation we've been having since she was very young, and she's willing to give up the privacy so that she can control her image. It's a part of self-actualization and, and part of her feminist um, showing up in the world. In the context, she has a very different, we have conversations about regulation of technology, very different cultural context in which she works from. So I wonder what happens now that we begin to look at this regulatory, and I, I can't agree more in certain contexts with you, but I just don't know what's the base, what's the normative framework we're gonna use to get at uh, regulation of technology? Yeah, I mean, lots of ways into that, but. One is, I think, by reframing this into a rights-based conversation and an individual agency conversation rather than sort of a top-down regulatory one. Um, this isn't about limiting people's right ability to share information if they want or to give their data in exchange for services if that's what they choose to do. It's about um, empowering them with the capacity to make an evaluation of that decision. Um, and the impacts of it. So things like um, clear and fair terms of service agreements, terms of use agreements, so that I make one sign up to a company when I'm 12 or 13, um, is that giving access to all data about me online for the rest of my life for any purpose? Well, that's probably not the right terms of use, but what is it? Um, we're testing that out in the EU right now where it's gonna be very regular, where almost any change to the service provided needs to have a new opt-in by the individual, right? So I, th I think we're gonna, it, it's productive from my point of view to get into a conversation about as individuals who produce a significant amount of data, data that has value in society and we know can be used for positive or negative effect, um, how much control do we have over that? Both 
how it's used, and the economic activity that stems from it. So this could be an empowering conversation, not a disempowering one. And we're working on a ISO standard called uh, the Personal Data Preference Standard. The idea is to deconstruct that all or nothing agreement, the binary agreement. I, either you give me all, every, all your data to use in whatever way I wish, or you don't use my service by um, having a negotiation between the data user and the data producer um, that you can declare as a data producer that this is the data I trust to you, to you whom, who I trusted to, for what purpose, under what conditions, for what length of time. Um, and that's part of what we're trying to bring through the regulatory process. But the other thing I want to talk, just very quickly mention is, I mean, privacy to some extent is the luxury of the people that are already secure. Many people who are fighting for survival are giving up their privacy in order to get services, in order to afford things. And so I, I think we need to think beyond privacy, we need to think about what, what are the risks and how do we uh, regulate the data use? Yeah. Hello, hi. Um, I'm, a, I'm about to build a very large platform if I'm successful at all. And you've represented quite a few concerns. Now, a lot of the concerns that are discussed here are frequently very, very clear, very obvious. But how would somebody, before building a platform, go about making sure they've addressed all of those concerns? I mean, you're three completely different people, uh, where would you go centrally? I would go, go, I, I would say don't go centrally, go to the edge. Uh, who, who, the way that you, you get innovation, the way that you get the, the type of the, uh, something new is to talk to people who can't use or who, uh, who have difficulty using the system that currently exists. You're, you're probably creating the platform to address some need that you think is, has not been adequately addressed. Well, you're going to get the greatest diversity of requirements, the greatest information about how to build it in a way that it will last and that it will be innovative and it'll do something new by um, f talking to people who can't use the current system or have difficulty using the current system. How do you? No, you can't go to everybody, but you iteratively, and I'd love to talk to you more about it, but we have a toolkit which, which shows how you can iteratively, continuously question again who is missing, who, who are we not including. And so, yeah, it's an iterative, agile process. Um, I, we've removed the notion of fix and solution from um, much of what we say because this is complex. Can I yep. one quick thing on that? So uh, last uh, comments from Taylor and Vass. I'm sorry, no more time for questions. Go. Okay, I'll go and then you can give the last word and contradict me. Um, in response to some of the Cambridge Analytical revelations, um, Sheryl Sandberg was quoted as saying, we never imagined our platform being used this way, and that is on us, right? And I think that points at what the key failing in this whole episode around Facebook was, which was, always looking at the positive uses of technologies and not looking at either the edge cases of who could be negatively affected or the potential abuses, which will always happen in open digital spaces. And so I think that points to how you, everyone should go about the design of technology, which is what are all the horrible things that could be done with this and all, who are all the people and groups who can be hurt by it um, and go from there. Vas? I mean, I think the days of what we sometimes call regulatory entrepreneurship are largely over, and that our institutions have gotten a little bit better at responding to platforms or something new. Your platform's probably, as you just said, going to solve some kind of perceived need, make things a bit easier for people, maybe match them to a service or a thing. Um, it's, not a, it's not a bad thing, but this increased awareness is really important. And we are seeing more partnerships or sharing between you know, technology companies and government. One good example here locally in Toronto is Waze. You know, they have a partnership with the city of Toronto. I'm no urbanist, but we're using Waze data to complement what we already use around traffic planning and, you know, urban planning and where we need more public transit. That's probably a good thing. It's not 
unintended consequence of ways by any means, but at the same time, we have, you know, tightened up distracted driving laws, and I have definitely clicked passenger when I'm driving somewhere and I need to figure out how to get there with ways. So, you know, there's room to improve. Thank you very much, Yuta, Vass, and Taylor. Um, we now have a break, so for those of you who have questions for these people, you can actually talk to them. And uh, lunch is quite a bit shorter. How much shorter, Jim? No, no, no. Lunch, lunch, we're on a lunch break now? Yes, yeah, so how much, oh, it's 10 minutes shorter. Okay, great. So you've got 40 minutes.